Okay, welcome to session number 24 of uh, Biblical Backgrounds. This is a study in uh, archaeology and geography and culture and history and anything else that we find interesting that provides the context uh, for the biblical narrative. Uh, I'm Dr. John McMath. I'm joined by my friends in Italy, uh, the Philippines, and around the U.S. Uh, and this is a uh, this is a, a time of both fellowship and uh, instruction. So welcome. Uh, today we're going to uh, continue with uh, Asia Minor and get into the Greek islands, and eventually we'll get into uh, Greece itself. Uh, as the church moves in the book of Acts, we know that the church also went east, but the Bible doesn't follow the church into Asia. Uh, the Bible follows the church into uh, the west, into the Mediterranean world. Uh, it's uh, actually a little hard to understand why that is, and I'm not sure I can explain it. Uh, perhaps God knew that the church would expand more rapidly in the West. I don't know. Uh, but eventually, the, uh, uh, the biblical imperative is to take the gospel to the whole world. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, so the movement into the West, I think, is a, a figure of speech. Uh, the Bible had to follow somebody. It followed the Apostle Paul. Uh, and uh, as we go into Asia Minor and then Greece and then finally into Rome, uh, we, we find this, this movement of Paul as a symbol of the movement of all of the apostles. Uh, and in following uh, other history, we see the movement into North Africa, which the Bible really tells us very little about, a uh, movement into uh, Central Europe, which the Bible tells us nothing about, uh, movements into Mesopotamia and uh, Persia and on into India and eventually even into China uh, that the Bible tells us nothing about. Um, but that's okay because we know what happened and, and uh, uh, sometimes we we win and sometimes we lose, but the church continues to grow. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a, a couple of background things first. Uh, uh, I want, I've got uh, slideshows uh, from uh, Patmos where the apostle John was in exile uh, and a, uh, a slideshow from the Pergamum Museum in Berlin which uh, gives us a, uh, some shots of the Temple of Zeus in uh, uh, Pergamum. I showed pictures of uh, uh, the actual site of Pergamum. It's uh, overlooking the ocean. It's about 2,000 feet above sea level with this magnificent theater and all kinds of monumental stuff. Uh, Pergamum was a very, very impressive place. So we're going to look at that. We'll look at the, the Zeus Museum or uh, the Pergamum Museum in, in Berlin. Let's, uh, let's begin with sharing the screen. And I believe I can do this just like this. Whoops. Yep, there we go. And is it working? Yes. Okay, Patmos uh, is an island off the coast of uh, Turkey. Uh, there's a, a, a fairly big island that's easy to spot on the map uh, called Samos. And there's nothing to see on Samos, actually. Uh, but from Samos, you can catch this hydrofoil to the little island of Patmos. Uh, I've been to Patmos several times. Uh, usually, I get there by ferry boat. Uh, but on this particular trip, we came through Turkey uh, and uh, we stopped at Ephesus and then went on to uh, uh, Samos and then Patmos. Uh, and uh, the intention was to catch a ferry boat for uh, Haifa in Israel, but the ferry boats were on strike. And so from Patmos, we went back to Samos and caught an airplane for Athens and then on to Tel Aviv. It was a mess of a trip. Uh, and uh, some days are like that. 
it can be kind of fun. So this is the uh, uh, this this is the uh, hydrofoil that we came in on. This is a picture of the hydrofoil going away. Uh, it takes about uh, uh, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour for the trip from Samus to Patmos, uh, because it, it moves quite quickly. It moves about uh, oh, about 50 kilometers per hour. It's a, it's a quick uh, trip uh, back and forth and relatively comfortable. The shot on the right is uh, me sitting on uh, what on a big ship would be called the fan tail, the the back of the boat in a fairly uh, comfortable chair, deck chair there on the, the back of the hydrofoil, it's kind of a fun thing. As we approached Patmos, uh, this, is, uh, this is the look of that island. It's not a big island. Uh, it, it looks like it fills up a lot of space, but it really isn't a very big island. The, uh, the village, the civilian or secular village, complete with hotels and restaurants and uh, a certain amount of uh, a commercial district is at the bottom. It's a, yeah, uh, the town is actually a really small town. There's a few hundred people uh, who live permanently on the island of Patmos uh, and uh, live in this small town. Uh, the major industry of the island of Patmos is tourism. Uh, people come on, usually on cruise ships. If you take a cruise in the Mediterranean, uh, this is one of the places that the cruise ships like to stop. Uh, so you'll, uh, you, you'll get off and you, you'll walk up to the top of the island. You see a kind of a a crust on top of the mountain. That's called the Chora in Greek. Uh, Chora means the, the crown or the top, and it refers to usually the monastery on an island. Uh, so there's a very strict uh, division uh, between the, the monastic space on the top of the island and the secular space uh, on, the, uh, on the bottom of the island next to the water. Uh, the, um, uh, the village here at, uh, uh, at the bottom of the island uh, forms around a, a harbor. And it's a pleasant little harbor. It isn't very big. Uh, if you're driving a big ship like a ferry boat, uh, this is something that comes regularly to Patmos. Uh, the, uh, the ferry boats have trouble getting turned around. Uh, they have uh, uh, sideways drive and all kinds of high tech stuff and they're able to turn in circles. Otherwise they wouldn't be able to get into this thing. Uh, the uh, uh, buildings are whitewashed because it's normally out here in the Greek islands uh, of the Aegean Sea, uh, the sunshine is constant. Uh, and uh, the only way to stay cool uh, is to be in uh, a whitewashed building with thick walls. So most of these are, are made of uh, uh, brick with white stucco over the outside. And uh, you'll notice the roofs are mostly flat here. In some places we're going to find domed roofs, but these are all flat. It doesn't rain very much in Patmos, but it does rain some. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not what we would call a desert island. It's actually a pretty nice place. Uh, this is the, uh, the goat path on the left. Uh, this is a road leading from the port uh, at sea level up to the monastery. Uh, the pilgrims will walk up the, the goat path. Uh, there's another road that you can go up with uh, bicycles or motorcycles. Uh, and <laughs> I, I took a group of men here one year uh, and they all wanted to to rent the, the little motor, uh, motor scooters to get to the top. Uh, and uh, they, they took off on these tiny little motor scooters. Uh, they, they looked like a, a Christian version of Hell's Angels head, heading up the, up the path to the, uh, to the monastery. And uh, that particular trip, I, I recall I walked up 
Uh, so I got some good pictures along the way. Okay, from the goat path, you get all the way to the top eventually. Uh, and uh, this is what the monastery looks like today. Uh, this is the monastery devoted to St. John. Uh, uh, because uh, the Apostle John was uh, an exile uh, by the Romans here on uh, the island of Patmos. This is where he wrote the uh, uh, book of Revelation. Uh, he didn't found the monastery. A lot of people say, oh, John founded the monastery. He actually lived in a cave somewhere on the island. There are rather a lot of caves on the island of Patmos, and we don't know which one was John's cave, although, of course, there is a tradition. Uh, you, you will be shown a cave <laughs> and told that this is it, this is, the, this is John's cave, but we really don't know. Uh, the, uh, the, the monastery is famous for its uh, very, very long continuity. It goes back to the fourth century and is uh, particularly devoted to the collection of ancient manuscripts. Uh, so uh, modern scholars come regularly to Patmos uh, to study the ancient manuscripts. Manuscripts of the New Testament are found here and regularly uh, because it's so, it's so rare to be allowed to actually handle the manuscripts. Scholars come, they, they apply years in advance uh, to have a few minutes in the scriptorium uh, and they're surrounded by the, uh, the regular monks who with lots of restrictions on what they can do and what they can see and what they can take pictures of. But it's still a regular process. Every year or two, we will find another uh, complete manuscript of the New Testament or a manuscript of uh, Paul's letters or of Acts or one of the Gospels uh, at the Patmos Monastery. Most of these are medieval. Uh, it's fairly rare anymore. Uh, to find earth-shaking new evidence. Uh, what we're finding is uh, more corroboration of the, uh, uh, of the accuracy, of the precision of the uh, copying process. Uh, and uh, every manuscript that we find uh, has interesting new variants, uh, every, every single one of them. They're usually tiny, uh, but uh, scholars take advantage of each and every one of those to uh, understand the process by which we got our modern Bible. Uh, and, uh, this monastery and several others like Mount Athos, also in Greece, uh, and uh, some in Turkey uh, are famous for their collections of ancient manuscripts. Okay. Uh, there's some details here. Upper right is the, uh, the paving of the goat path. That's just old rocks. Uh, and those are very, very rough and nasty. At lower left is this beautiful lady. Uh, I saw her uh, while I was walking up the mountain. Uh, and uh, uh, she just looks like she's got so much character and so much history. Uh, there's so much background just in that face. Uh, so I, I asked her permission uh, to take this picture, and she posed for me. Uh, and, uh, she's one of my favorite people in Greece. It's just, uh, it, uh, just a fun picture. Uh, the flowers uh, let us know that this is, this is not a desert. This is actually a fairly comfortable island. The view from the top of the island is like this. You can see virtually the whole island here. Uh, if I were to turn 180 degrees and shoot the other direction, uh, you would see uh, just a quarter of a mile or so, maybe maybe half a kilometer uh, to the uh, Mediterranean on the other side. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a dog bone shaped island with uh, mountains on either end and a little low isthmus in the middle. And that's where the port is. 
uh, and you can see uh, some cruise ships that came in while I was walking up the mountain. Another shot, uh, several more shots of the monastery. Uh, it's uh, very well kept today. It's uh, very tightly controlled. Uh, not everybody can get in, uh, uh, but uh, and uh, for the group that I was with, it wasn't worthwhile to try to go in uh, the day I took uh, these pictures. Uh, in order to uh, uh, for it to be worthwhile to go in, you just about have to uh, have an invitation to look at the manuscripts, and I never have. Not not worth the uh, the effort for me because I'm that's not my thing. Uh, more shots on Patmos. Uh, John spent you know significant amount of time in this area. Uh, then as we're Coming back down again, uh, there goes somebody's yacht, a, a sailboat, uh, heading out of uh, out of the harbor, uh, and a, a wide view of the uh, of the port. The port is called Scala. Uh, so we're going to say goodbye uh, to Patmos. It, it's a pleasant place to visit. Uh, I suspect it would be a hard place to live. Uh, because there really isn't much to do there. Uh, it just is a pleasant, I, I think it might be a nice place to retire, uh, if, especially if you're Greek, you know, spend, uh, spend a lifetime out doing merchant shipping and then come back to uh, Patmos and just live out your retirement uh, writing memoirs in your, in your village. Anyway, that's, uh, that's Patmos. Uh, and it's a real place uh, it really was used by the Romans as a place of exile. Uh, so uh, it's a fairly, fairly well known, fairly well known thing. Let me kill that. And I'm going to show, we're going to go on to the Pergamum Museum in uh, uh, Berlin. Let's see if I can make this happen. All right. Now I'm going to have to put something else out of the way. Slideshow presenter view. Oops, there it goes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Pergamum altar, uh, actually altar and temple, uh, found its way to Berlin about a hundred years ago. The Germans were uh, excavating in Asia Minor uh, at the ancient Roman sites there, and uh, they, they had the wherewithal, they had the means to move the entire temple, the whole thing, to Berlin. And so they did. Uh, and they built a museum around it. Uh, during World War II, uh, obviously, uh, Berlin was in the crosshairs. Uh, and uh, uh, Berlin was being turned to rubble. Uh, the entire contents, the, this entire temple uh, was taken apart bit by bit and uh, stored in uh, a bomb shelter. Uh, at the end of World War II, the Russians came into Berlin uh, and they took over the museum island at uh, they took the Pergamum temple uh, on freight cars back to Moscow. <laughs> and, and there it stayed in the basement of a museum or in a warehouse in Moscow until 1989, as I recall, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the uh, 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 lots of uh, glass gnaws and the, the Russians trying to uh, uh, be a part of the world community again, the Pergamum altar came back to Berlin uh, and the, uh, uh, the city of Berlin has been in the process of rebuilding the museums on the museum island uh, there in the middle of town. Uh, and this museum is part of that. Uh, so Pretty neat thing, actually. I'll just show you a few slides from there. Uh, this is a model. I give you an idea of the of the whole structure 
uh, two layers of carving, a grand staircase. There's a, an actual altar in the, in the middle. This part of the temple is primarily uh, the sacrificial altar, just one part of the, the whole temple structure. Uh, the carving is perhaps the most uh, impressive part. There's lots and lots and lots of uh, marble statues. Uh, this is uh, Zeus in the form of a, um, a Greek emperor or something like that with his crown of laurels on his head. Uh, here we have a Corinthian column top. Uh, you can see the close-up of the carving. Uh, and there are literally hundreds of these just like this. Uh, here are uh, naiads, a couple of faces in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the marble relief. It's called a frieze. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, marble uh, sections are stacked up in exactly the way they were in the original building. Uh, here's what's left of the uh, uh, statuary along one side. Uh, the, the statues form an entire facade. Uh, uh, this is uh, gods and goddesses fighting with monsters. Uh, and it, it really doesn't matter very much, but you can tell that the, uh, the sculptor had at least some notion of actual human anatomy. They, they probably worked with cadavers, uh, dead people. Uh, they may have had live models for uh, some of the elements. Uh, the artists who did this are completely unknown to us today, uh, but th they obviously knew what they were doing. Uh, here are more of the same sort of statues. Uh, the carving of something like this is uh, remarkable. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the frieze again. It, it tells a story. If you were to read from left to right, it's a story of gods and goddesses fighting monsters and bringing chaos into creation. Uh, so it's a story of Zeus and uh, the whole family of gods and goddesses creating the world by eliminating chaos. Um, and that's actually not such a strange idea. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to argue that they, the Greeks got it right, uh, but, uh, but there is an ordering of uh, the universe that is uh, part of the biblical story. Uh, this is a, a part of the model that shows how the altar of the temple of Zeus fit into the broader uh, town of Pergamum. You can see in this model, there are lots and lots of monumental structures. Uh, this was a very, very well-structured, well-designed uh, imperial center. More elements around the uh, around this museum, uh, just uh, one after another, after another, after another. Uh, all this statuary, uh, gods and goddesses fighting against monsters all the way around it. And of course, this attracts large numbers of tourists. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the Pergamum Museum is in Berlin rather than in Pergamum in Turkey means that lots more people will see this. Uh, so very famous thing. Uh, uh, John, uh, in writing to Pergamum, uh, speaks of uh, the city of Pergamum as the place where Satan's throne is. Uh, many scholars believe that what John was referring to was the Temple of Zeus, uh, uh, this very temple right here. Yeah, there's a uh, again, statues, more statues. I don't even know what all the statues are. 
statues with boats, statues with demons, statues with snakes, statues with gods and goddesses going after uh, various kinds of very scary monsters. Uh, the the concept is right. Uh, the, there is a, a power in God that brings order out of chaos, uh, but they've got it wrong. They gave the wrong name to God. Uh, they've got too many gods. Uh, it only took one God to bring order out of chaos. Uh, nevertheless, this is one of the most impressive archaeological finds in the ancient world. It is uh, significant for New Testament studies in that we uh, we understand our New Testament against a background in which the whole world was pagan. Uh, the entire world, the ancient world around the Mediterranean, uh, uh, was emphatically and articulately pagan. Uh, this was a very well thought through system uh, that was held by virtually everybody. Uh, and the young Christian movement was fighting uphill uh, against uh, a, a very well supported, well built, uh, well endowed pagan system. Oh, yeah. What do you do? And yet, the pagan system fell, and Christianity became the dominant religion in the Mediterranean world. Uh, and uh, from there, uh, filled up the whole world. So I'm going to quit that one, and we're going to go on to yet another, see if I can make another share screen come up. Okay, this one. We're going, this is where we, uh, oops, no, stop share. That's not the one I wanted. Seems like all the time I'm fighting with my thing. Share. All right. Now, now we're doing what we're supposed to do. Maybe. Bingo. Okay. There's Patmos, and we've already seen those pictures. So we'll go on to the next one. Paul went on from, uh, from uh, uh, Asia Minor into uh, Macedonia, which is northern Greece, and then farther south. Uh, some of the most famous cities in Paul's uh, stops uh, are there in Macedonia and in Greece. Uh, we know about uh, Paul's uh, 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 European uh, ministry uh, from Acts 16. Uh, he received the, uh, uh, the Macedonian call in Acts 16. Uh, and uh, he must have had some reason to think that Philippi was the place to go, because that's where he headed. Uh, he journeyed directly there without stopping to preach along the way. There are some places to stop along the way uh, that uh, might have been fruitful, but Paul went directly to Philippi. Uh, there's good reason to think that Maybe the man making the call in the vision was Luke the physician. Uh, good old Dr. Luke, who is also the historian of the book of Acts and of the book of Luke, uh, has been suggested uh, as the author of the Macedonian call. Uh, I, I think that's not, a, that's not a bad suggestion. From Acts 16 on, uh, the uh, the book of Acts begins speaking of we. Uh, so from that place, we went on to Philippi. We went from there to Thessalonica, and then we went to Berea, and so on. Well, who is the we? It has to include Dr. Luke. Uh, so Luke doesn't appear in any of the uh, the biblical narratives, 
prior to Acts 16. Uh, so we think this is where he, he he appears, and it may well be that Luke was the one who ran into Paul, and we're not told how they met, and said, come over to, uh, to Greece and help us. Uh, the, um, the motto of uh, the Anglican missions back in the 17th and 18th centuries, when, when they were just starting to do missions, uh, was uh, the Latin translation of uh, Acts 16.9 uh, changed grammatically just a bit, and it's, uh, uh, we go abroad to be of service. Uh, we, we, we go overseas to be helpful. <laughs> and that's, that's what Luke was asking Paul to do. Come over here and help us. And so we go over there and help. Uh, in, uh, in Macedonia in particular, we, we find a lot of, uh, really impressive ruins. Uh, again, the ruins, uh, sometimes we'll find a modern city over the top of the ruins. Uh, but, uh, usually there's ruins out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this map is, uh, uh helpful for, uh, Paul's, uh, journeys to, uh, uh, to Greece. This is the second uh, 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 journey. Uh, we know that uh, Paul left Antioch, went through Tarsus, revisited the churches of uh, Galatia, and at the same time that Paul uh, went up into Galatia, uh, Barnabas headed back to Cyprus. And I uh, took Mark with him, uh, and, uh, which is a very interesting story. We're not going to go there. Uh, uh, Paul uh, came up through uh, the provinces of Asia and Mycia, all the way to Troas. And that's where the Macedonian vision happened. Uh, it's uh, quite likely. Uh, that Luke met Paul at uh, Troas. Troas is not too far from the ancient site of Troy. So the Trojan Wars actually happened in the same area. Uh, this is south of uh, Istanbul, oh, by about uh, 50 kilometers. It's not a great distance off. Uh, Paul came across the northern Aegean Sea past the island of Samothrace. Now, Samothrace is a, a big deal. Uh, there's a great big temple on uh, Samothrace uh, and a, a very, very popular cult that uh, went on at Samothrace. But apparently there was no, uh, there was no Jewish community in Samothrace. So Paul stopped there and got on the boat the next day and went on to the port of Neapolis, and then on to Philippi. From Philippi, Paul is going to go through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and will have a ministry at Thessalonica. From Thessalonica to Berea. Then from Berea, he'll go uh, aboard ship again, all the way around to Athens, uh, through the port of Piraeus. Uh, from Athens over to Corinth, uh, where he stayed for about a year and a half. From Corinth, Paul is going to head back to uh, Antioch, and this is in uh, Acts chapter 18. He will end up uh, coming through Caesarea and into Jerusalem and then overland uh, through uh, Syria to Antioch again, where he gives a report to the church. Okay, this is uh, found on Samothrace. Uh, this, uh, uh, this photograph is of a statue that we call the Winged Victory of Samothrace. And this isn't a very good picture. Uh, this, uh, uh, the museum where I saw this was uh, not very well lit that I had to shoot from a long way off and blow it up. It's, it just, it, so this is the best I've got. Uh, but Paul and his opinions stopped here just overnight. Uh, and they continued on to Neapolis and Philippi uh, from this 
this island. Um, if Paul had spent any time at Samothrace, he would have seen the mysterious rites of the sanctuary of the great gods that was here. Uh, deities worship here included uh, the, the pre-Greek god Demeter, well, actually goddess Demeter and her spouse Hermes. Uh, it's uh, surprising how many of the ancient Greek deities are actually couples, but uh, Demeter and Hermes. Uh, others included the twin demons known as uh, Kabiri, who eventually would become Castor and Pollux uh, in the uh, uh, Latin group. There's a god named Hades here, who is also Pluto. Uh, the, um, uh, the planet is named after uh, the god Hades. There's a, god, uh, a goddess named Persephone and another Venus. Venus is very famous, uh, also known as Aphrodite. Uh, in Paul's time, the mystery religions uh, were drawing very large crowds here uh, and were strongly opposed to Christianity. The mystery religions were a reaction to the irrationality of the ancient pagan religions. Uh, and yet the, the mystery religions were, uh, to my mind, no more rational than the pagan religions. Paul decided not to get into that particular uh, argument. He just decided to move on. Uh, so about 49 AD, we see Paul arriving uh, at the coast of Europe uh, here in Neapolis. Uh, this is the modern port city of Neapolis in uh, far northern Greece. Uh, he would uh, have uh, the, uh, the modern city is called Cavalia, uh, but uh, it is certainly Neapolis. Uh, it was right on the main east-west route. Uh, which we call the Ignatian Way or Via Ignatia. Uh, the north-south route uh, to the gold mines in the mountains also came out here. Uh, from the time of Philip of Macedon, who is Alexander the Great's father, this town served as the port for Philippi and it's most famous as a jumping off point for Brutus and Cassius when they were fighting against Octavian and Mark Antony at Philippi in 42 BC. The, the same Mark Antony who uh, uh, fell in love with Cleopatra and all of that uh, going on. Uh, in uh, modern Cavalia, there's nothing that dates to New Testament times. Uh, so uh, this is the only picture we need from uh, uh, Neapolis or Cavalia. Here's a, a little bit of the Ignatian Way. Uh, the Ignatian Way is a, uh, a Roman road. Uh, the Roman roads are uh, nothing magical. Uh, they were just very well built. Uh, the uh, Romans would, uh, would dig uh, as far down as they needed to, usually about three meters, and then would fill up that hole with stone, uh, layers of gravel, uh, and then larger blocks, uh, and then finally uh, a pavement, a uh, cobblestone pavement on the very top. And in many, many places in Greece and Turkey and Italy, we can still to this day find the remains of the Roman roads. Uh, they're, uh, they're actually very common uh, and uh, they're very well built. Uh, the, uh, the Bible is careful uh, to make a note of when Paul was walking along one of these great old Roman roads. And so here he was, and he, he would have come up eventually to Philippi, which is about uh, five kilometers away on the Ignatian Way. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, city of Philippi is the location of the conversion of Lydia. Uh, Lydia was from Thyatira, and uh, she was a seller of purple. 
Uh, and uh, we don't really know for sure uh, the uh, uh, precise location of the conversion of Lydia. There are several places that fit the description outside the gate and beside the river. Uh, there's an actual little red Greek Orthodox chapel built in one of those spots, complete with uh, monuments and uh, a pleasant place to walk. But the fact is, we don't we don't know. So I walked up the Crickaways and took this picture of the river because that's probably what it looked like. Okay, this is a, a wide shot of Philippi. I've probably got some more pictures of Philippi. Yes, I do. Uh, Philippi is a, a major city. It was uh, fairly minor until 42 BC. Then it became really important uh, uh, because the, uh, the Romans decided to garrison the place. Augustus refounded the city as a Roman colony in 27 BC. And the residents became Roman citizens by birth with all the privileges accompanying that status. It was actually a really big deal. Uh, in uh, Acts uh, 1612, uh, uh, it uh, 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 says that uh, Philippi was the leading city of the district, but it wasn't the capital. The capital was Amphipolis. Uh, but the, uh, the city of Philippi was probably uh, the commercial center of the district. Uh, Philippi has been excavated for about 100 years uh, by French and German teams, mostly. Uh, the most impressive Roman ruins uh, date to the second century. There's very few discoveries that relate directly to the New Testament era. Uh, however, we have found a large Roman forum. You can see a pavement uh, between the spot that I'm standing uh, and the, uh, uh, the the tall ruins of a cathedral off in the distance. And that pavement area is the Roman forum. I have not much to see, but that's uh, that's what it is. There's a bema, uh, and again, all there is is, is uh, flat ruins of this. The Bema is a platform for judgment. Now, this was probably the spot where Paul stood uh, when he faced the magistrates of Philippi. I'm going to stop this chair and see if I've got uh, the... Uh... Oy. This should be right here, and I should be able to go right to it. Yeah, here we go. All right. Okay, this. Now I need to kill this. You know, there's got to be a, a simpler way to do some of these things. Let's share that. Share. And now we'll do slideshow and share. Okay, this is a shot of um, uh, the region around Philippi. Uh, and, um, this is uh, uh, part of what I usually call uh, 500 slides from a moving bus. Uh, we were on the bus from uh, from Neapolis up to uh, Philippi. And this is, it's a very mountainous area. When we come to the uh, the city itself, what we find is a broad field of ruins. This is Donna standing in front of the, the Roman Forum area. Lots and lots of inscriptions, uh, and, uh, some of them more interesting than others, and all of them in Greek, of course. Uh, hardly anything in Latin. This part of the empire was entirely Greek. Uh, the, the Romans didn't prohibit uh, Greek. Uh, they, uh, they valued the Greek roots. Uh, this is uh, uh, ruins in the area. Lots and lots of monumental stuff. 
Uh, this shot is a uh, part of the uh, the theater area, and here uh, that's that's me in the back walking into the theater through this arch, and you can see this thing. It's not a gigantic theater, but it's big. Uh, it's still used uh, in the modern era uh, for uh, musical presentations and the occasional Greek drama for enthusiasts. Uh, this is a part of a, a basilica that was uh, an early church in Philippi. The churches that we, we find in Philippi uh, all date to the fourth and fifth centuries. Uh, they're relatively late. Uh, we don't have much of anything that really can be demonstrably dated to the uh, first or second centuries. Uh, and all, all of the ruins are late. What this does tell us is that Philippi uh, was not only a leading town, but it was a leading Christian town. Uh, the, uh, the Christian influence here uh, was uh, large, it was widespread, it was quite powerful. Uh, here's uh, one of my students standing in uh, a series of rooms built into the side of a hill. It was a part of this great big church. Here are ruins from uh, one of the three full-size cathedrals uh, in the town. And when I say full-size, I mean really, really large. You can see the massiveness of the marble stones uh, that went to build up the monumental structures. This was very, very, very large. Uh, this is the uh, uh, part of the piazza uh, next to the Roman Forum uh, with this big old church uh, to one side. As a very, very large building. Uh, the diagram of that building uh, is called the Basilica B. There are two basilicas, an A and a B, complete with a dome and arches and all, all, the, all the stuff. Uh, it's a very, very large, uh, 62 by 47 meters. Uh, very big building. Uh, here we see one of the interior arches uh, around uh, the dome area of the basilica. Uh, massive stuff, carefully cut stone, nicely made. Uh, Philippi was obviously a wealthy city and the church here uh, had uh, money to spend on a very nice set of cathedrals. Uh, in, uh, in most cities later on in the Middle Ages, most Christian cities of Europe would have a single cathedral, one big central church where the bishop had his business. Uh, Philippi uh, has three large basilicas and uh, a really ancient uh, martyr church. I'll show you pictures of that here in a second. Uh, this is the uh, uh, commercial area of Philippi, and we're walking toward an interesting building. It, uh, th this looks like a field of stones, uh, but when we take everything apart, underneath that canopy that you see in the background is a series of mosaics that form the floor uh, of a uh, a domed chapel. Uh, the, uh, the domes, uh, when we build an octagonal church like we, we find here, those domed octagonal churches were usually built over the top of a martyr's tomb. This one is dedicated to the Apostle Paul. Uh, and it, the, the details of what has been found here here you see the, the columns that supported the dome. Uh, it was a large dome. Is this the size of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem? Uh, and uh, dates to approximately the same period. Something this large and this complex and this obviously important uh, to exist at the same time with the other large churches in Philippi 
church buildings uh, indicates that somebody important was buried here. Uh, the uh, Philippi tradition has it that this was the Apostle Paul. Roman tradition has it that Paul was uh, killed in Rome and is buried there. Uh, there. There is no tomb of Paul in Rome. There is a, quote, tomb of Peter in Rome, which I also doubt. Uh, but uh, here in Philippi, there's, this claims to be the tomb of Paul. Um, I'm not quite ready to throw out all of the ancient tradition, but I find this fascinating. Uh, Philippi uh, was obviously a city that was very, very important in Paul's life and in his ministry. He was strongly supported by this church, uh, and he wrote fondly to them. Uh, and his disciples, like Timothy and Epaphroditus, uh, worked at Philippi, and the church became clearly one of the leading churches of this part of the world. So it's entirely possible that uh, uh, the Paul came back to Philippi and died here. Uh, I don't think we can prove that, uh, but I find it a very interesting hypothesis. Here we are walking down a uh, paved sidewalk. It looks looks like uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, church building in uh, uh, Malalas. Uh, it's, uh, same same kind of uh, oh, mosaic tile work. I, I really like that. Okay, and then here's the Ignatian Way again uh, as we're heading out of town. Uh, there is a building in uh, Philippi, in the ruins here in Philippi, that uh, is often labeled uh, the Philippian Jailer's Jail, uh, and it uh, clearly isn't. It's actually a medieval storeroom. That's uh, so why I haven't bothered with any pictures of that. Okay, let's get rid of this one. See if I can. We'll stop that share and start an additional share. <laughs> like I say, 10 million slides from a moving tour bus. Let's see. Okay, back to Philippi. And which one is it? It is this one. Okay. All right, there we go. So that was uh, that was Philippi, uh, a very interesting place to visit. Uh, Am, uh, Amphipolis in Acts 17, uh, Paul and Silas uh, left Philippi. They made directly for Thessalonica, and they didn't stop at Amphipolis. Uh, today, we have uh, quite a bit of stuff going on here. Uh, 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 Luke adds that uh, there was uh, a uh, synagogue of the Jews uh, in uh, Thessalonica. Uh, so they didn't stop at Amphipolis. Paul always started with the Jews. Uh, archaeological research uh, has failed to turn up any evidence of a synagogue or a Jewish presence uh, at uh, Samothrace, Amphipolis, or Apollonia. Uh, and uh, Amphipolis itself is a beautiful spot. Uh, right on the Aegean in uh, New Testament times. It was a big city. Uh, it was four and a half miles around, about uh, about seven kilometers around the outside of the city. Uh, the lion of Amphipolis is uh, this big guy on the right. Uh, and, uh, this is a monument that guards the bridge on the river next to the town. It dates to about the fourth century BC. Uh, so when Paul came through, he would have waved at the lion. Uh, we move on from there to Thessalonica, in Greek, Thessaloniki. Uh, and this is the modern city of Thessalonica. It put him right in the middle of things. Uh, Thessalonica was the capital of the second district of uh, Greece. Uh, in uh, New Testament times, it was the seat of government for the whole province of Macedonia. Uh, it was a free city 
under Roman senatorial rule only. So there would be no local Roman governor. It was a, a completely free city and did its own thing. Uh, Thessalonica is in a natural amphitheater at the head of uh, uh, what we call the Thermaic Gulf. Uh, it's uh, close to the uh, to the water, uh, but you don't see it from here. Uh, the strategic location, again, on the Ignatian Way and on the commercial sea routes, uh, it guaranteed that it would be a commercial center, a cultural center as well uh, for the ancient world. Uh, there seems to be a significant Jewish population here. Uh, Paul was able to preach to the synagogues. Uh, and, uh, and having preached to the synagogues, he used that as a base to reach out to the local Greek population as well. Uh, the city of Thessalonica has uh, not been well excavated uh, and hardly anything has been found that relates to New Testament times. Uh, one question has been touched on. Critics have long asserted that Paul was mistaken in his use of the term politarchs for the leaders of Thessalonica. Uh, the, uh, but but uh, that's a term that uh, Luke uses in Acts 17.6. Uh, so at Thessalonica, we found an inscription in the ruins of an arch. Uh, much later, it's like second century AD. But here's an arch in Thessalonica, which includes the line in the time of the Politarchs. So what time was that? It was a time from long before. The inscription has been carried off to the British Museum in London. Uh, so even if you visit Thessalonica today, you won't see that inscription, you'll have to go to London to see it. Uh, we know that the term was quite common uh, in the inscriptions, uh, and it is it is used. Uh, Luke was exactly right to talk about the Politarchs. Okay, let's do Berea. This will be the last place we go. Uh, Berea is the uh, uh, modern city of the same name, Beraya. Uh, and it uh, uh, continues west on the Ignatian Way. And there were, apparently was a synagogue in Berea. Uh, the modern city hasn't been excavated at all. Uh, most of what's been found in Berea have been the result of construction of modern buildings in the area. And we found no inscriptions in Berea yet. Uh, one of these days, perhaps we will. Uh, the uh, uh, existence of the church here is well attested in medieval times, but we found no ruins of anything here yet. Uh, and, and all except that the place with the correct name is exactly where it's supposed to be. Bottom line on all of this, and uh, before we get to Athens, I'm going to spend some time with Athens. And so we'll do Athens on Wednesday. Uh, but the, the point of all of this is that the geography, uh, the importance of the places, the location of synagogues, uh, everything that we are able to put together from the archaeological background uh, supports and provides illustration and background for the New Testament text. Uh, true statements, true stories have a background of real factual stuff. Uh, buildings and roads and rivers and ports, uh, real stuff that fits into stories uh, that are true, uh, fits in accurately. Uh, the Book of Acts is um, uh, an accurate historical recounting of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, now, does that mean that everything that Luke says is absolutely true? Well, no, uh, but a true story can always be confirmed 
by the circumstantial details. And we've got tons and tons and tons of circumstantial details. Um, if, if the book of Acts is a lie, if Paul never existed and never did all these things, it's very difficult to explain the existence of the book of Acts at all. Uh, so that's a, that's a big part of it. And uh, just uh, looking at things like this, this is uh, the, the Parthenon in Athens. Uh, Paul saw these buildings uh, uh, and uh, uh, tried to preach the gospel in this place. We'll think about that again on Wednesday. Let me stop this one. And let's see, go over here. And I'm going to unmute all of us so we can talk again. Uh, guys, thank you so much uh, for coming by. It's always good to see everybody. Uh, I, I look forward to the teaching days uh, because I get to see everybody. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to take off now. Uh, thank you, Dr. John. Love you guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I bet you. My pleasure. Bye, right Don. Bye, bye. Hey, do I see Don there? I thought I saw Don. Yeah, there. I made it. <laughs> All right, good man. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye, bye. Thank you.